Good afternoon. I am Marco Turati, Chairman of APOS Study Group. Warm welcome to this webinar about pediatric meniscal tear. This is our second webinar organized by our study group after the successful webinar about OCD of the last year. I wish here to acknowledge the EPOS Hill Learning Task Force for their hard work, and in particular, Sunny Itunen, our precious EPOS Education Manager, and our previous chairman and friend, Frank Akadbled. And the last but not least, orthopediatrics that support this webinar and without whom this event will not happen. We have selected this important topic because meniscal injuries in children continue to increase, but pathogenesis, imaging, diagnostic process, and treatment are still debated and in evolution. Today, we will give you some current concepts based on our knowledge, recent literature up to date, and personal experience. We wish that after this webinar, you will have your mind clear with specific and essential points for a better management of your pediatric patient. In our webinar, we'll present meniscal tear in two different conditions. Patient with a traumatic tear in a normal meniscal anatomy and patient with discoid meniscus. We will try to describe them in terms of pathophysiology, imaging, and optimal management. Here is the program that we have prepared together today. We have seven speakers in live together. So first, I will talk about discoid meniscus epidemiology and pathophysiology. Then Joao Cabral from Coimbra will talk about the diagnosis of discoid meniscus. Next, Frank Akadbled from Toulouse will present arthroscopic management of discoid meniscus. Then we will move to epidemiology and pathophysiology of traumatic meniscal tear, also with associated ACL injuries with Stefan Tercier from Lausanne. Next, Pieter Berg from Leuven will talk about the diagnostic process in traumatic meniscal tears, and Monica Tusing from Lisbon about arthroscopic management. Next, Camille Tenin Lemoine from Toulouse will present us postoperative rehabilitation, return to play, and uh, prevention. Then I will have the privilege to conclude and give you the take home message. And last but not least, we will drive a question answer session in which we will try to be as interactive as possible. And now let's start with the webinar with my presentation about epidemiology and pathophysiology in discoid meniscus. I have no disclosure about this presentation. So discoid lateral meniscus is the most common anatomical variation of the knee joint in pediatric population. The actual incidence is difficult to estimate due to the large number of asymptomatic patients. There are different incidents according to interracial characteristics. Higher incidents are reported in Asian countries with 14 to 17 in Japan. Commonly, discoid meniscus is lateral and the medial discoid meniscus is very rare and less described. Historically, the studies report uh, an incidence of bilateral meniscus, discoid meniscus ranged from 5 to 20 percentage of patients. However, recent study with MRI or arthroscopic evaluation of a contralateral knee in the symptomatic discoid meniscus reveal higher rates ranged between 73 and 97 percentage in Asiatic countries. There are also some anatomical characteristics that uh, are strongly associated to discoid meniscus, as the high fibular head or hypoplasia of lateral femoral condyle. A defined etiology of discoid meniscus is still debated. Smiley in 1948 stated that discoid meniscus resulted from a resorption failure of the center of cartilage plate during fetal development. However, different fetal studies show a normal meniscal shape in, parental, in prenatal knees. Now we know that the meniscus was formed between 8 and 14 fetal week, and discoid meniscus cannot be considered a normal stage of embryogenesis. However, fetal, however, discoid meniscus is an anomaly already present during fetal development, probably due to an anomalous morphogenesis. 
at the moment, no single etiological factor was identified, but the incidence rates in different ethnic groups and families suggest a genetic influence on the development of this anomaly. Further support for this hypothesis came from studies of, on, uh, on twins. Recently, morphological changes in terms of gene expression were rich, and interestingly, apoptotic and autophagic gene levels are increasing in discoid meniscus. We can state that discoid meniscus should be considered both in morphological and genetic modulation manner, but the real role of these genes should be defined. About histological characteristics of discoid meniscus, we have to underline that it thicker than normal one with intrameniscal mucoid degeneration and an alteration in number and organization of collagen fibers. Interestingly, Ku and Mina describe in an anatomical study that the discoid meniscus is classified into seven layers based on collagen fibril orientation. Moreover, they stress that peripheral portion of discoid meniscus is constructed to bear load and it's crucial a preservation of the peripheral portion of discoid meniscus. However, other studies describe that extracellular matrix was less dense in periphery, where there are also less vascularization respect to a normal meniscus. This structural abnormality make the discoid meniscus more prone to tear. Actually, in symptomatic discoid meniscus, more attention is given to peripheral, peripheral rim. Recent study started from this interesting question. Does, does lateral discoid meniscus have inborn peripheral rim instability? Kim checked and, and measured peripheral rim instability with an arthroscopic ruler in discoid meniscus and normal lateral meniscus without a tear during arthroscopic procedures for other reasons. The study demonstrated a greater anterior and posterior instability also in discoid lateral meniscus without a tear. Thank you, and uh, let me give the floor to my friend Joao Cabral. Thank you, Marco. Uh, now we go through diagnosis of uh, this quite lateral meniscus. We, we start on symptoms, then we pass through physical examination, and then we'll go through imaging. We know that in stable uh, discoid lateral meniscus, they are incidentally detected in patients with asymptomatic or with subtle clinical presentations, like cl clicking. And uh, otherwise, in the unstable uh, discoid lateral meniscus, they are associated with the classical symptoms, snapping or popping with pain, effusion, giving way, and locking. Uh, Han and his team work uh, published in 2008, in their studies on their repair of uh, discoid lateral meniscus, and um, they gathered 28 lateral discoid meniscus, he collected all their clinical manifestations, and as we can see here, 75% of these patients have uh, extension block. Uh, more than half of them have pain, then 32% with loud click, and locking uh, joint line tenderness and giving way was present in more than 20% of them. Patients uh, uh, may present with effusion, lack of terminal extension, anterolateral bulging at full extension, positive McMurray tests, and joint line tenderness. Uh, we cannot forget that we need to suspect the uh, discoid lateral meniscus uh, on the contralateral knee, like uh, Marco said, it's important due to their uh, higher bilateral incidence. Uh, in children younger uh, than 10 years old, they tend to present with spontaneous intermittent snapping, the inability to achieve full extension. We can see here a child with a snapping in, when achieving the full extension. And then in adolescents and young adults, uh, they may present with pain and mechanical symptoms. The overall sensitivity of clinical examination of this pathology varies 
uh, a lot, uh, depending on uh, the examiner's experience and knowledge. So uh, we need to uh, have uh, further imaging studies uh, to, to characterize this pathology. And so uh, going through imaging before uh, talking about MRI, I would like to give a, a, a brief consideration on plane radiography. Uh, we need to consider that it's a supplementary modality for this diagnosis because most of patients present with normal plane radiography, but we can see some subtle indirect signs. Like in this patient, we can see here, he has a, a left discoid lateral meniscus, and we, we can see in this image the widening of the lateral joint space, uh, the squaring of the lateral femoral condyle, and the uh, hypoplasia of the lateral tibial eminence, if you can compare it to the, the contralateral side. The MRI is the important diagnostic tool uh, that we can adjunct to the clinical features of the discoid lateral meniscus. Uh, it's useful, useful for diagnosis and also to access uh, the peripheral detachment of our meniscus. Uh, we have some suggestive diagnostic criteria like the minimal width of uh, more than 50 millimeters in the coronal plane, like we can see in the image on the right top, and three or more five millimeters thick consecutive sagittal slices showing a continuity between the anterior and posterior horns in the lateral meniscus. Uh, this, uh, the MRI can also provide information on meniscal substance, tears, and the presence of accompanying pathology like OCD. As we can see here in this example, we have a patient with a, lateral, a discoid lateral meniscus who has uh, four consecutive slices of uh, uh, sagittal uh, MRI. Uh, only in the fifth, we can see a discontinuity of the, of the meniscus. So this is suggestive of discoid uh, meniscus. Han and his team worked also uh, proposed an MRI classification for this pathology providing information on surgical planning uh, with respect to the direction of the meniscal shifting um, based on their uh, peripheral detachment. And so they uh, gather all this information and divide it in four types. Uh, the first type, the anterocentral shift type. We can see here in the, in the images, uh, the meniscus is shifting anteriorly and on the coronal plane shifting centrally, so we can suspect of a postural lateral disruption or instability. Then the, the another type, the postural central shift type, the meniscus will shift posteriorly and on coronal plane uh, centrally. Then we have the central shift type, where we can see the degeneration of the discoid lateral meniscus without anterior or posterior shifting, but we can see the central shifting, um, suspecting of uh, uh, a lateral uh, disruption or, or instability. And then the, the fourth type, the no shifting type, where we can only see the, the degeneration of the discoid lateral meniscus. And this classification is important because with this we can suspect and we can plan our, uh, our surgery. And to talk about our arthroscopic management, I pass now to Professor Franca Cazlet. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Um, now we will address the arthroscopic management of uh, discoid meniscus. So obviously uh, today it has to be arthroscopic. So this has been uh, described in a, in a book chapter which I wrote together with uh, Loïc Geoffroy uh, for uh, ESCA. The procedure starts with the joint exploration, um, also checking for uh, osteochondritis to the lateral femoral condyle, which is uh, associated with uh, discoids. Then the meniscoplasty, which is also called uh, saucerization. Basically, this is trimming out the inner part of the discoid. Then the testing, uh, combining probing 
also checking uh, the range of motion of the knee for uh, instability of the residual meniscus and then obviously uh, repair uh, when necessary. So on the, on the left, you, you can see uh, the discoid uh, with the probing. This one uh, looks pretty stable. You can see how thick it is and mobile. Then uh, we start uh, trimming the inner part, like I said, using a, a basket punch. So during this step, this is uh, very important to switch working and viewing portals just to make sure that you actually reject the correct amount, uh, which uh, usually leaves about eight to 10 millimeters uh, ring. And then uh, I find useful uh, to uh, use a shaver to smooth uh, the edges of the residual meniscus uh, together with uh, removing all the debris from the joint. So here are represented uh, the three steps. And if you pay attention, you can see on the, on the left hand side that uh, there is represented the femoral footprint of the PCL, which tells you that this was indeed a medial uh, discoid meniscus. This is a very rare entity. Uh, and in this month's uh, JPO, it was uh, reported as the first uh, case series by uh, Boston Children's uh, team. Then uh, we move to the testing, starting with the probe. We have to check for peripheral instability and also for intrasubstance tears. Uh, most uh, often, this is a horizontal cleavage. Here is an example uh, of a posterior lateral corner, corner loss type. When you pull, you can see that uh, the posterior segment uh, shifts into the notch. Another example, in this case, the meniscus was very stable after meniscoplasty, therefore did not require any further treatment, like uh, namely repair. In this case, this is checking the range of motion. You can see that when we bring the knee in extension, the anterior segment shifts posteriorly. When the knee is brought back in, in, in flexion, it relocates nicely. So this uh, displays here uh, an anterior um, tear uh, according to an classification, which we will uh, describe uh, right now. Uh, this is the arthroscopic classification. Joao has described the MRI classification. So uh, the type A is the anterior tear, which is called uh, uh, MCA type. The type B in the middle is when the meniscus is detached posteriorly and then shifts anteriorly. And then type C is the posterior lateral corner loss type. Uh, the tear is located at the, the level of the popliteal tendon. Now, if we want to make a correlation between MRI and arthroscopic findings, here uh, there is a posterior shift type. There is too much meniscal tissue at the back and none left at the front. So this is an MCA type. So basically the meniscus is detached from the front. In this situation, you will look for an inter anterior tear and repair it accordingly. In this case, uh, top, uh, top left, you see that there is too much meniscal tissue anteriorly and no tissue posteriorly. This is the anterior shift type according to the MRI classification. So you would expect uh, uh, the meniscus to be detached posteriorly. Then it can also be uh, shifted in the notch. This is the central shift. And this is associated with a detachment at the level of the popliteal tendon, namely the posterior lateral corner loss. So in both these two situations, you would expect a posterior tear, and then uh, it would have to be repaired accordingly. So now, when it comes to uh, repair, in a nutshell, 
everything which is at the back, so posterior aspect of the middle segment and posterior segment can be addressed with all inside uh, sutures. Uh, the rule is to uh, use vertical sutures as much as possible and to have mattress sutures because basically, as Marco uh, told us already, uh, the volume and the thickness are uh, uh, altered, but also the histology and microstructure. So those collagen fibers are not oriented circumferentially. So the suture is light, likely to cut through if there is no, not enough uh, tissue purchase. And the other thing is, for the same reasons, you want to place a, a suture at least every five millimeter for more stability. So for those lesions at the front, so MCAA types, uh, you would use outside in technique with using the meniscus menda represented here, for example, or the catheter can do the job. Here is a case example of a posterior shift. So this is the menisco capsular anterior type. Uh, you can see on the coronal view that there is too much menisco tissue at the back and there is no uh, meniscal tissue at the front, and you can check that uh, better on the uh, sagittal view here. So this is how it looks like arthroscopically. When you bring the knee in extension, clunk, this is the arthroscopic clunk, the uh, anterior segment shifts posteriorly. So this is the treatment, uh, including the meniscoplasty represented here using the basket punch, then using the shaver, you can see here that, interestingly enough, with the suction of the shaver, this brings the anterior segment posteriorly. So if you don't manage this, sometimes uh, it is uh, helpful to use a, a temporary anterior uh, outside-in suture just to maintain the anterior segment during the meniscoplasty. So you can put a clamp on it or have your assistant pulling uh, on the suture. Obviously, once this is finished, you check here the anterior segment is unstable and needs to be repaired with the outside in suture using the uh, meniscus mender in this particular case. So you can retrieve the suture. You may want to use a non-absorbable suture or long-lasting absorbable suture like a PDS in this, uh, in this case. Again, uh, it has to be vertical mattress suture for more stability. Then you check again during the, the range of motion and the meniscus is now stable. Intrasubstance tears, we know that they are pretty frequent. Uh, in this case here, represented on the left, we can see the horizontal cleavage. Uh, so this has to be uh, managed, obviously, uh, first, uh, refreshing the edges using the shaver or a meniscal diamond rasp and then you put vertical mattress sutures as uh, represented on this video here so basically the principle is to close the gap close the mouth uh, to prevent the synovial fluid from going inside uh, which could compromise uh, uh, healing or at least delay healing second situation Again, horizontal cleavage, but you can see that the upper uh, lip is uh, much thicker than the lower lip. So this is fully acceptable in this to proceed with a partial meniscectomy of uh, the lower lip in this particular case. Now, if we have a look at the very recent literature considering the outcomes of the arthroscopic management of discoids, uh, this is the experience of Boston Children's uh, in this month JPO, about more than 400 patients, uh, pediatric age. Uh, they reported a 63% rate of tears, and like I said before, horizontal cleavage mostly. Now, this is the same, uh, the same authors uh, about the long-term uh, uh, results like uh, 15 years minimum uh, follow-up, about 46 patients, they report satisfactory functional results. But interestingly enough, a 44% 44, 44 revision rate, mostly due to re-tears. So I think this is important to be considered to inform the patient and family that the revision rate is actually higher 
than uh, for traumatic tears because uh, the structure of the meniscus is also altered. Now, the, this final paper, again very recent from uh, the Knee Journal, is uh, about uh, the uh, MRI outcome. So they investigated the position and size of a residual lateral meniscus after surgery, and this compared to controls. Interestingly, the width was equal, so back to normal, but there was a larger anterior and lateral extrusion of the operated discoid, and preoperative shift and repair were risk factors for extrusion. Now we close the discoid chapter and I want to introduce Stefan, who will now address the traumatic meniscal tears. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, great uh, European uh, sports team. Yes. Okay. So what about uh, the, the, the physiopathology and the uh, epidemiology of traumatic meniscus? Uh, I declare no disclosure about this presentation. The two main functions of the meniscus are first force transmission. Uh, it increased the congruency of Professor the... Professor Kersiev, unfortunately, we don't see your video. Could you put your video back, please? Yes, sure. Sorry. Thank you. So, force transmission, increased congruency of the, of the joint, act as a shock absorber, and uh, you can see it transmits 50% of weight-bearing load in extension and up to 85% in flexion. So any defect or tear, a tear in the meniscus will severely compromise this function and uh, leading to an arthritic process. The second function is stability, and you can see that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is the main secondary stabilizer to anterior translation of the, of the knee. And the lateral meniscus is less stabiliz stabilizing because he's more mobile, and you can see he can move around 10 millimeters versus 3 to 5 millimeters for the medial meniscus in full range of motion. Mechanism of lesion is uh, mainly direct trauma or squatting with a valgus and twisting motion at the knee when playing sports or while lifting something heavy with uh, forces who lead to uh, uh, compression or shearing lesion to the meniscus. I don't speak about discoid meniscus, it's already done by my colleagues. Um, the type of meniscus are uh, mainly horizontal, vertical, and radial, you know, ramp lesion, bucket handles, and flap tears. The localization is also important, uh, could be in the body, in the anterior and posterior horns, or roots. And the zone, as Frank said before, white or red zone are very different for the healing because of vascularization. This recent study of 2019 about uh, almost 900 young patients from uh, 2000 to 2015 show that there is an increased rate of meniscal tear and surgery. The risk factor from the study show that male adolescent or higher BMI are risk factors as more intense athletic activity, early sports specialization or year-round competition and for sure increased awareness and screening from the medical team uh, has increased this rate of meniscal tear diagnosis. The same studies show that during this time, from 2000 to 2015, there was about this, all this meniscus, 47% of meniscectomy. So uh, in 2016, there was the first congress about the, the only the meniscus with present of the future save the meniscus in Porto. Uh, in the same study, you can see that 45% has concomitant anterior cruciate ligament rupture and reconstruction. We can see that from uh, this uh, 
study that lateral meniscus and posterior horn are the very mostly uh, um, um, lesion and the type of uh, tear is bucket and vertical tear and also degenerative uh, before 18 years old. Uh, as, as, as I spoke to, to just before, 45% um, uh, has um, an associated lesion as ACL uh, rupture. This is the most recent and extensive study published. And the other one from 2021 show that in ACL deficient knees, 58% uh, has an uh, associated meniscal tears, uh, more, mainly also in ACL deficient knee uh, in the lateral meniscus, but you can see that one quarter of the patient has a bilateral or a B, uh, B meniscal uh, tear uh, at this time. The risk uh, increased also with age and with the BMI in this study. So about epidemiology and pathophysiology, take home message will be 45% of meniscal tears are associated with ACL injury and 58% of ACL injury are associated with meniscal tear. And three quarter of all these lesions are sports related. The lateral meniscus is more frequently injured than the median meniscus in ACL deficiency and in stable knees. And there is mainly the posterior horn who is, uh, who is located the lesion. So torn meniscus or meniscectomy uh, lead to uh, knee arthritis, and that's why you have to save the meniscus. Thank you very much. I let my, me introduce now Peter Berger from Leuven, and he will speak about meniscal tear diagnosis. Thank you for the introduction, Stefan. So uh, a good evening uh, to everybody uh, from Flanders. Over the next five minutes, I'd like to take you through the key points in diagnostics, physical examination and MRI of the uh, chromatic meniscus tears in children. I have no conflict of interest pertaining to this talk. A meniscal tear will most often be suspected with a history of a traumatic event. Typically, isolated tears of the meniscus are the result of uh, rotation and deep flexion. Of course, we should suspect concomitant meniscal injury when an ACL tear is present. Uh, in that setting, one needs to be aware of the so-called hidden meniscal lesions, like the ramp lesions and the root tears. You don't see them, but they definitely have seen you. Most common symptoms are activity-related pain and mechanical complaints, as locking or snapping. Other common complaints are swelling and instability. The child is not a small adult, so examining a child's knee could be more challenging. We visually check for gait abnormalities and compare the affected knee with a healthy contralateral side for quadriceps atrophy and knee swelling. An aspiration of swelling can show the presence of clear synovial fluid versus blood. In fact, a traumatic meniscal tear was shown to be the third common cause of knee hemarthrosis after the usual suspects ACL tear and patellar dislocation. Medial or joint line tenderness can raise suspicion of a meniscal injury in the respective uh, site. When we start to move the knee, most typically a fixed flexion deformity can be appreciated, illustrated here with a patient in prone position. Specific meniscal tests, like the well-known McMurray and Epi tests, can be performed, but these are less sensitive for meniscal injury than the Tesseli test, where the patient is asked to twist the body over the affected knee in 20 degrees of flexion. It is positive when discomfort or mechanical complaints are provoked by this maneuver. For obvious reasons, lower limb alignment, patellar tracking, and knee stability should be checked. For the, most, uh, the more recently described root and ramp lesions, um, the clinical picture is limited and non-specific. Only one clinical sign of medial meniscal root avulsions has been described by Sile and his colleagues. Uh, one should be aware of the possible presence of these lesions in the setting of an ACL tear, although a medial meniscal root tear is most often found as an isolated lesion. 
and in a child, never forget to check the hip. It wouldn't be the first case of skiffy or a tumor in the hip region that ends up on the operation table for an knee arthroscopy. MRI is a preferred diagnostic modality to investigate the meniscus, but it cannot replace the importance of a good physical examination or a plain X-ray, and it should not be used as a screening tool. General anesthesia may or may not be necessary to uh, reduce artifacts due to movement. Uh, in comparison with adults, the sensitivity for detection of meniscal lesions is lower because of the increased vascularity of the meniscus, which can be misinterpreted as a meniscal tear. This decreases with age, as shown by Takeda and colleagues. This is an example of a vertical tear of the lateral meniscus in the anterior horn. Uh, the signal is seen this, the signal that you can see in the posterior horn is not extending to the articular surface, as opposed to the signal in the anterior horn that uh, extends to the articular border of the meniscus in several consecutive slices. Specific features of bucket handle tears on MRI are the double PCL sign, where the dislocated meniscus appears as a second PCL, and the absent bow tie sign, where the normal bow tie-like shape of the meniscus on sagittal images has disappeared because of the dislocated inner part of the meniscus. Uh, on sagittal images, uh, a ramp lesion may be suspected due to irregularity or a fluid-like cleft signal at the meniscocapsular junction of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. But as I said before, Physiologic changes, which are most commonly observed in this posterior horn of the medial meniscus, make MRI rather unreliable. Another clue for a ramp lesion is bone bruise at the posteromedial edge uh, of the tibial plateau in the setting of uh, ACL tear. And then finally, features of a root tear uh, of the medial meniscus. Um, again, bone bruise in this region uh, in the posterior plateau a truncated aspect of the posterior meniscus with fluid-like hypersignal in this area, meniscal extrusion, and the ghost sign, where, uh, which is illustrated here on the video, where the uh, posterior meniscus suddenly disappears on consecutive sagittal slices. So in conclusion, the diagnostic power of MRI is less secure in the younger population, but it can be valuable when linking it to a good history and clinical examination but think about the hip. And finally, be aware of hidden meniscal lesions as they see you, even if they didn't see you, uh, if, even if they didn't see, you didn't see them, excuse me. With these final remarks, I wish to give the, finals, uh, the stage to Monica uh, in Portugal for her talk on the management of these lesions. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so, we already know that a traumatic meniscus tear has a history of a sudden onset of joint line pain, generally associated to a nip, uh, knee injury. It can be um, defined as a stable or unstable according to its mobility. The main function of the meniscus, as we know, is load distribution and impact absorption. So, the location and the type of the and the time of the tear uh, de uh, determines uh, its impact on the future meniscus performance. The um, meniscal injuries are uh, comparable to the meniscus injuries in adults. Um, most frequently in children and adults, you see the complex, the vertical, the buckle handle, and the radial uh, fractures. Um, it is essential to locate the tear exactly. So Connolly writes the meniscus in interferential uh, interfer and the radial zones to better describe the location of a tear. Um, if you start doing it, it gets a routine for you. And with the time and afterwards, it is very useful to compare um, your own results. 
and to do um, science. So very quick, we already talked about this. Uh, we have the vertical tiers. It's the, uh, the, the most common to be repaired. And most of the reported clinical outcomes are really related to this type of um, tier. Um, it is often extensive, so a resection would equal um, a subtotal ex uh, excision. If you have a displaced fragment and it is not generative and it is reductible, consider always um, to repair it. Here the radial tiers um, define always the incomplete tier and the complete tier where the incomplete tier does not go or extend from central to the really um, more um, peripheral um, collagen fibers. So the meniscal remains intact and stable. Um, the horizontal um, tiers in young patients are not at all comparable to the degenerative uh, um, lesions. Uh, they are due to overuse and repetitive microtraumatic lesions. There are different treatment options. Normally, they are not very painful, so uh, for a long time uh, they go with conservative treatment because you don't know uh, before that there is a lesion. Uh, as soon as you know it, um, Try or repair them, trepanation and repair the fibrin clots or meniscectomy if it's a, a very small um, central region. Um, the horizontal tears often goes along with um, perimeniscal um, cysts that can get really big. Um, these indications um, show the indications for adults. So in the patients in the child who have always the right age, normally the lesion is sports related, so they are overall healthy and hopefully not too overweight. Um, inform about postoperative period as well the patient as the parents, sometimes even the, the coach. In the rupture, ideally um, it should be in the red zone or in the red white zone and should not be too old. In children, whenever possible, we should suture horizontal tears. The complete radial tears and the tear at the ramp and the root. Contraindication in children are mainly the non vertebral lesion and the poor meniscal quality after long term uh, rupture. Essential elements necessary for meniscal repairs are over, about all the possibility of anatomical reduction, repairation of the bed for the meniscal suture, circumferential compression, and stability of the knee. Suture site preparation can be done with a meniscal rasper, as you see in the, um, in the above uh, uh, the, um, picture, um, or with a, a shaver, being careful not to remove too much tissue. Especially in older ruptures or in the less vascular area, consider using a needle or combination. You can use your own um, suture needle, or um, if you're afraid that it will despair, um, a long spinal needle. In isolated meniscal repair, um, proceed to bone marrow stimulation for intraarticular bleeding. Um, the suture techniques differ mainly because of the atroscopic uh, difficulty to reach the different places of the meniscus. So you have mainly the outside in for the uh, 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 repairing of the anterior and middle third of the meniscus, the inside out technique and the outside in technique for the posterior and middle third. In the configuration of the suture we defer, our friend already did the vertical from the horizontal sutures, knowing that the vertical suture demonstrates a greater laboratory improvement of strength. They are preferred over the horizontal suture. The horizontal suture is less resistant, but um, made with an all inside system, it has a less tissue penetration and can be um, useful in danger zones. Um, the tighter the knot does not correlate um, with a, a better clinical outcome. So when you have the technique of an outside in um, suture, it is a really cheap method because there are specific instruments, but you can do it with a, a normal needle, um, a wine catheter. The suture itself can be non-absorbable or absorbable. The passage of the sutures is percutaneous. Then an incision is made in the skin where you can help yourself to prevent damage, uh, trans illuminating the skin from inside out before doing the incision. So you can see the veins or the tears and prepare and then pre prepare your weight until the capsule. The threads are retrieved and the knot is given directly over the capsule, checking tension by the scope. 
the inside out technique is um, or is um, still the gold standard for children in which the suture is performed from with the support of or a single or a double uh, cannula. These can be able to be bent, so you can have uh, different um, angles to locate the meniscus. And there are specific needles uh, that you use. Um, used in posterior injuries, it is mandatory to protect the neurovascular structures or or with special cannulas that exist. The all inside structure suture became more and more sophisticated. Um, you see here the side uh, different types of from different uh, firms. Um, they facilitated um, with this uh, the use and provided more security. In the children, it is um, interesting because you can use the depth of the penetration of the needle um, of the device. So um, if you have a small child, you can um, think about getting a very small uh, um, um, depth from the needle. In the meniscal capsule separation, it may not be um, um, providing enough uh, fixation, um, so it is always convenient to have an intact peripheral meniscal bridge to give um, more stability. By repairing um, such a vertical longitudinal tear, sometimes when you um, um, or it can happen that after um, the upper vertical suture, there is um, a further opening of the lower tibial side of the of the rupture. So always look at the tibial side when you uh, are performing a, a meniscus repair. And this happens, you make a, a second um, suture at this surface as shown here. The repair of an horizontal rupture restores to normal biomechanics between the tibia and the femur. Clinical results appear to be similar to other uh, patterns of sutures. So when proceeding with the suture, care must be taken to remove um, the avascular zone, um, never leaving the femoral leaflet longer than the tibial leaflet. And there, are, um, there is the way of suturing the muscle like a hayball, as shown in the picture before. <laughs> Uh, up, uh, fixing the thread around the meniscus or from inside the tear itself in order to close the tear from inside. The complete radial tear over 90% um, is a serious injury equivalent to a fully functional meniscectomy, so it is important to try to treat this meniscus. Also repairing complete tear significantly improved biomechanics, it is less resistance than intact meniscus. In the all inside suture technique, be careful to use a thin suture so that the knot does not disturb in the joint. So suture technique, technique is like seen in the picture from periphery to central and you do various sutures after taking away the avascular and rib zone. Small and incomplete radial tears that are only in the white white zone can be treated with special meniscus to be with good results. The ramp lesion um, it has a difficult diagnosis. It is in a blind spot for conventional uh, anterior portals, so it is necessary to systematically evaluate the posterior medial compartment entering through the notch, medial to the um, posterior cruciate uh, ligament, or perform a posterior medial portal. It is more unstable than a peripheral vertical eruption, hence it has a greater risk of not healing if it is not treated. Um, just very short to the roots, if you make or treat a root in a pediatric population who is uh, skeletally immature, do always check the physis during surgery um, with uh, C-arm, avoid the physis, slow motion brokerage so that it doesn't get hard. Just um, so when you think about how to treat a minister in a child, how does it think about three or four things that you have to have in mind? For how long does the tear exist? Where is the tear located? What type of tear is it? And how is the tissue quality? Um, and how were the patients or the parents engaged to cooperate with you in the post, um, post, uh, post um, operatively? So here's a um, 
bucket handle lesion. Um, at first, it was an oxide. It is a girl of 12 years. Um, she waited a long time until she came to the consultation. It was more than six months of time when I saw her the first time. But even though um, you could check in the arthroscopy that it was reductible, um, the tissue was not so bad. So um, then you prepare the suture site and starting, I, I normally start in the back with the fast fix or with the uh, all inside technique. Um, then um, I made, like Frank said, the first um, the anterior region, so to, to take it to the, uh, to the right spot and then uh, the inside out sutures. Here, a uh, case of um, horizontal tear with a big meniscal cyst. So I boarded it openly to um, take the cyst away, um, made the suture, and both of them went back to their spots. So there is no evidence to support any postoperative regime, um, but uh, the um, senior authors um, advocate early partial weight bearing and early passive weight job motion. And the choice of rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitation may be influenced by the meniscal tear pattern, localization, and uh, overall patient's compliance. You have to know that it, takes its time to repair, so four to six months, um, you have really to be careful with them. I personally make weight bearing, non-weight bearing for four weeks, um, then partial weight bearing for the fifth and sixth weeks, and total weight bearing from the sixth to eighth week. And um, the moving, um, I let them move until 90 degrees for the first move. Four weeks, then 130 during 12 weeks to protect the posterior home, uh, horn, running at three months and contact spots at five to six months. In a small child, um, because of the weight bearing, when I'm not um, sure that it uh, will go by crutches, I put um, um, a splint that is uh, um, removable just to, to walk. It takes it away in the night and uh, the other time when it's not working. One reason for the heterogeneity in report the, the outcomes is the difficulty um, to know is it repaired or not because 10% of the asymptomatic individuals do not have complete um, repaired meniscus. The MRI is really good for, um, the, for the first or primary rupture but to evaluate um, the rupture or to evaluate the success of a, a suture it, um, gives a high um, um, signal, uh, signal in that um, area for over 12 months. So at risk remains the gold standard, but is uh, invasive. And more recently, um, there are many people doing an MR atroscopic to um, assess. So some regard of outcomes. Um, oops. Meniscal tear patterns have been well characterized in the adult population, but extensive studies have not been performed on the uh, pediatric and adult population. There are much less um, publications. In the published series evaluating meniscal repairs, there is no consensus on the ideal technique. The ability to repair meniscal tears was significantly lower in patients treated after six months from injury, especially in male adolescents. Then in the first three months, that you want to evaluate it, repair with second look atroscopy with a clinical success rate of 83%. Um, Long-term results of partial meniscectomy are not so good as the concept of meniscal preservation is therefore progressed over the years and Nowadays, it's saved the meniscus. Long-term comparative studies and meta-analysis with personal meniscectomy have demonstrated the superiority of meniscus repair in terms of function, return to squat, and cartilage protect. That's a study from Pujol. So what do we know? Partial meniscectomy uh, results very good for a short time um, clinical results, but has a high rate of progression to osteoarthritis at long term. And comparing the meniscus repair with the meniscectomy, there are longer, better longer long-term outcomes, but there is a higher reoperating uh, rate. So you have to talk to the parents, especially, and to the, to the child. So it still depends on the technical experience of the surgeon and the surgeon mindset. 
if it, if he believes in the healing capacity to the care about the long term results, um, it is important to know indication, extended indications, and the limitations. It's cost effective and not everyone has the surgical tools in their operating room so take home message take the risk of failure and if it fails the amount of secondary resection will not be higher than the primary virtual meniscectomy a repair as early as possible is better and important patient information and compliance with the rehab program discussed previously uh, write it down um, more time consuming more complicated rehabilitation program and with the risk of re rupture so in 1967 and that it's the time when much of us were uh, perhaps born or a bit afterwards it was take it down uh, out take it all out by smiling um, only in the turning of the millennium there started to be more meniscus saving operations and today it's really save the meniscus as early as possible. So now I give back or I give uh, I introduce to Dr. Camille Tevinin Limwan. Uh, thank you, Monica, for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, about rehabilitation, uh, there are many possible variations in postoperative management. Most of the authors recommend partial support, immobilization with inch brace, rehabilitation start at two weeks, and possible flexion up to 90 degrees. But all combinations are possible. It will depend on the etiology, whether it is a primary repair or a revision on the type of meniscal lesion, the age of the patient, and mainly on the surgeon's habits. Theoretically, immobilization and protected weight bearing protects the healing tissue from damaging shear forces, which occur during pivoting and squatting motions. One of the main concerns is a compression of the posterior segment of the meniscus beyond 90 degrees of flexion. But are these fears justified? To analyze this, I will detail two experimental studies. Richard investigated the effect of compressive load in porcine longitudinal lateral meniscus repair. A pressure transducer was placed into the lateral meniscus cut and the knee was cycled into flexion and extension. The graph shows the degree of flexion of the knee on the abscissa and the pressure measured on the ordinate. The highest compressive force occurred at full extension and the lowest at 90 degree of flexion. Beyond 100 degree of flexion, it increased steadily. Higher pressures were seen with internal rotation of the tibia, suggesting torsional forces may be different than axial loads. At no time, there were negative pressures registered that would suggest meniscal, menis, meniscal cut separation. They conclude that weight bearing reduced the meniscus and stabilized the repair. Lin assessed the effect of postoperative post range of motion following meniscal repair using a cadaveric model. They created a, a 2.5 centimeter posteromedial meniscal, meniscal tear six spherical markers were implanted into the men medial meniscus on either side of the tear they repaired it with inside out vertical sutter specimen was subjected to simulated open chain flexion and extension they measured the displacement of the marker from 90 degree to 135 degree flexion on the graph positive value correspond to measurement where the distance between markers increased, including a gap in the lesion, indicating, indicating sorry, a gap in the lesion. On the contrary, negative values correspond to measurement where the distance between the markers decreased, indicated compression of the lesion. They found that neither the meniscal tear nor the meniscal repair demonstrated significant gapping. It rather compressed in the transversal plane. 
In the literature, the clinical pediatric studies confirm the results of these experiments. Strict immobilization, delayed physiotherapy or discharge did not seem to improve meniscal healing rates. But no study has spe specifically studied these parameters. Failure rate increases with complexity of the tear. It then seems logical to postpone weight bearing for complex tears and revision. Concurrent ACL surgery was associated with slower recovery, but also with a lower reoperation rate. Bleeding induced by ACL reconstruction creates a blood clot at the site of meniscal suture. This provides a supply of bone marrow stem, stem cells that may be beneficial to the healing process. Meniscal repair failures of, in children frequently occurred early with 12% occur, occurring within three months of surgery, 42% within six months, and 80% within 12 months after surgery. It then seems logical to To delay the resumption of sport activities. Usually, non weight bearing activities are resumed first after four or six weeks. Running should be delayed for three contact sports, can be resumed at four to six months. The Techno score assesses the level of physical activity. In the majority of cases, patients returned to, the, to, return to their pre-injury level. Uh, there is little to say about prevention for isolated meniscal tears. Muscle strengthening is a main point. It helps to better absorb shocks and improve the movement control in the joint, which reduces the risk of meniscal injury. These are there are warm-up programs developed by the Federation, such as the FIFA 11 Plus program. It was developed for the prevention of ligament injury, but uh, they can be extend, their use can be extended uh, to the meniscal injuries prevention. I give the floor to Marco to conclude this webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Camille. Uh, did you see the screen? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and see you later in the question answer session after my quick conclusion. Uh, the few take home message. Uh, one moment. Discoid meniscus and the normal meniscus present different uh, injuries patterns. Please remember that MRI features of a meniscal tear uh, is uh, typical and keep in your mind the existence of a normal vascular bundle in pediatric patients. In children, a greater portion of meniscus is vascularized, which makes it more amenable to repair. But as Frank suggests, please consider an higher risk of retear of discoid meniscus at the long term. However, in conclusion, in children, we recommend preservation of meniscus tissue whenever possible. Uh, there, uh, then, then future perspective. Uh, there are uh, amazing future perspective about discoid meniscus for our study group. Indeed, a prospective multicentric court protocol is recently defined as well as a grant funding to support our research. If someone is interested, please contact me by mail. Thank you again to everybody and uh, let's start with the question of time. So, for all the faculty, we can start with the first question. Uh, the first question is uh, uh, about knee MRI. So uh, it's addressed uh, to Peter. Uh, 
um, the question is how to define if uh, an MRI alteration signal of the meniscus is a tear or is a normal vascular sign. Good question. Peter, did you get a question? No, I didn't get a question. Sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry Peter. Let's go, Frank, if you want. No, no, no. I just wanted want to refer because to to, uh, to not to refer always refer, but to repeat for Peter. So the question was uh, related to the MRI. Uh, how can you make the difference between uh, um, an abnormal signal, uh, which is not uh, actually a tear, and a one? Uh, which uh, is uh, uh, correlated to an arthroscopic tear? Uh, that's always a difficult uh, matter. Um, in fact, uh, what I try to do is uh, uh, always link it to my uh, clinical examination. That's one. And second, there is a classification uh, on these tears or on these signals uh, where um, the probability that there definitely is a meniscal tear uh, gets higher when the signal extends on consecutive slices uh, to the articular border of the meniscus. So if it's just a signal within the meniscus and you don't see really extension uh, to the articular borders, the chance that there really is a meniscal uh, tear uh, gets lower. And then uh, my threshold to go and scope this knee gets higher. Huh? If it's, of, uh, if it's linked to a, a very suggestive clinical examination, maybe my threshold gets a little bit uh, lower again, um, but there's no definite way of uh, making this diagnosis of a meniscal tear on MRI. Eh? So it's always a little bit uh, weighing the chances uh, and the probability um, and explaining this to the patient that at the end, or the patient and the parents, but at the end, maybe you will not find anything uh, during your arthroscopy. Okay, thank you, Steph. Uh, let's go. Peter, what what about the art arthro MRI for the diagnosis? Um, that's a that's that's a good question, Stefan. Uh, that's uh, uh, an investigation that's uh, uh, more uh, used in the in the, the French speaking part of. Uh, of Europe, I think uh, it's not something we oh. commonly use uh, because it's, uh, of course, it's quite invasive um, uh, because you have to inject uh, the contrast medium. Of course, an arthroscopy is also invasive, but uh, I, I don't really have uh, experience with the specificity and the sensitivity of this investigation. I don't know what your experience is with it. You, you, the, the advantage is to specify the 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 tear with the with the the the, the suture or the the healing yeah. because mm -hmm. the tissue can be uh, is different is not is not the same gray scale you can see the liquid uh, through the the meniscus and you can diagnose the clearly uh, a new tear or a, a non uh, um, reparation of the of the of the meniscus but I, I agree with you. It's invasive, and uh, it's not uh, easy to 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 to, to give this this uh, proposition to to everyone. Yeah. If if I'm not a, not uh, sure of my repair because the patient uh, keeps complaining, I'm I have a low threshold to go go back again and scope the knee. Um, yeah. Yeah. Likewise. No, Thank I think you. it makes sense. If the patient do not complain about any symptom, clinical examination is normal, so you shouldn't risk up the patient. But as soon as the patient complains again, something must be wrong. So instead of doing something which is invasive but with no chance to do anything about it, like a, a CT scan with injection or arth uh, arthrogram MRI, then I, I would... Uh, I would have a lower threshold, like, like you said, uh, to, to go back and to have a, a second look. Okay, thank you. 
uh, the next question is uh, about uh, discoid meniscus treatment. So it's addressed to Professor Akad Bled. Um, the participant uh, say um, underline that discoid meniscus is often uh, associated to valgus deformity, lower limb deformity. So they ask uh, if uh, a partial epiphysiodesis can uh, create a more virus mechani mechanical axis and so can uh, protect uh, the discoid meniscus and uh, ask if you perform uh, epiphysiodesis in these cases and in uh, which period of uh, life. Is clear the question? Well, thank you. In theory, yes, it does make sense on a biomechanical point of view. But this being said, I've never been in this situation um, in which I combine um, correction of uh, a valgus deformity uh, together with the repair of a discoid or the management of a discoid. Um, first, we have to consider physiological uh, alignment of the limbs in children and adolescents. Um, then in uh, dealing with uh, uh, skeletally immatures, again, we would have probably a low threshold to offer uh, uh, growth modulation or ME epiphysiodesis, uh, then addressing a skeletally mature individual, osteotomy is a complete different uh, treatment. So I don't think, uh, unless the deformity is, is gross, uh, I, I wouldn't do it. Okay, thank you. The next question is um, for uh, you, Stefan, is about um, traumatic uh, meniscal tear and the question is about uh, the frequency of this uh, pathology in pediatric and adolescent patients about your experience uh, about the literature is there are also in pediatric patients or only adolescents no not only adolescents we know that uh, it's linked with the activity and uh, and the, the weight and you 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 have seen both in uh, acl uh, rupture and in uh, um, in uh, um, alone many meniscal tear you 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 have uh, the, the 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 same uh, problem um, i don't remember my sentence in english sorry <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's live um uh, sorry about that. Uh, it was clear in my mind, but now it's not no more. Maybe some someone can help me. Try out in French, uh, Stéphane. Uh, oui, mais il faut me reposer la question du coup parce que je suis euh, j'ai été dérangé là en même temps. Uh, Marco, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, please. please yeah. Go on. The, uh, the frequency of meniscal yes. tear in pediatric patients and adolescents. Is the same uh, or uh, is more frequent in adolescents? No, more frequent in adolescents, uh, as you see, with age is more and more, and with uh, also with the weight, because BMI is also also a, a risk factor, and uh, so I think we we we, we are all looking more uh, here in uh, in adolescent or pre-adolescent than in uh, five to ten uh, children years old children. But it's it's happen, and you have to to look for if the the if the the, the clinic is uh, looking like a, a meniscal tear. Perfect. The last question for all the faculty uh, about uh, treatment of traumatic meniscal tears. Uh, in a in a slide, uh, Monica uh, talk about bone marrow stimulation before uh, meniscal repair. The question is, uh, someone of you have experience about uh, bone marrow stimulation of the meniscus before uh, suture in a pediatric patient? In my personal experience, I have never used it, but uh, the, the question is for all the faculty. You use it when we have, when we know that's a really old um, or more than six months old. And in that case, that I I, I, um, I showed the buckle handle. There, I, I made it in the notch, just two um, little um, uh, pins in the notch, so that it would 
blood inside the, um, the knee afterwards because it was six or nine months of um, rupture. It was a buckle handle, a, a big one. It was unstable in the beginning, but it went to the place. So we, we do it sometimes, yes. Not so, do you not so often. Do you perform per micro perforation of the. No, in the in the when when I uh, tell it, it's like um, when you make um, a micro micro fracture, but in a zone where you don't need it, just so that it bloods inside. You can do it in a, in a notch. Can I add something, uh, uh, Marco? Yeah. So uh, my protocol, when there is an ACL tear and I drill tunnels, you don't need marrow venting, you don't need bone marrow, it's coming anyway. So then you have a very good chance of healing. If it's an isolated tear that I will, uh, will repair, then I always do marrow venting of the notch. So then uh, I make with the micro fracture all, I make uh, micro perforations of the lateral wall uh, just in front of the ACL. Um, to stimulate. I don't know if it's uh, really worthwhile, but uh, I think it's better than doing nothing. And I don't think it's really going to uh, um, have a negative influence on outcome. So no that's one that's make what... a prelevation of bone marrow from the iliac crest and injection. No, no. Okay. no, it's the same what Peter was saying, that that's what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, if uh, there are no other questions, uh, we can, um, I can give a thank you to all the sport group members for uh, their hard work and thank you uh, to all participants. Uh, from my point of view, it was a very amazing and interesting this uh, webinar and uh, I hope that uh, everyone can return in their clinical practice with more uh, uh, curiosity and uh, desire to follow our pediatric patient. Thank you to everybody and have a nice uh, night. Bye.